Hello. Hey everyone, welcome. We've got people coming in and we'll just give everyone a few more minutes to, to join in um, and we will begin very soon, everyone. more people still joining us. Um, we're just sort of right on 12 by my computer's clock anyway. So um, give everyone just another couple moments and we'll begin very soon. Welcome everyone. All right. <clears throat> Kia ora koutou katoa, ko Austin Toku Ingoa. Welcome everyone, my name is Austin. Uh, today we'll be exploring our new climate positive certification. You'll hear from me first about the new standard, the inspiration behind it, what it is, how it stands apart from our other offerings, and of course, how to achieve it. Uh, and then next you'll hear directly from our first certified members, uh, EcoWare and Emma Lewisham. We'll save time at the end for your questions, but please feel free at any point during the presentation to drop them in the Q&A box at, um, and we'll, we'll get to those at the end. Um, we are recording the webinar and we will be sharing it with attendees along with a copy of my slides at the end. These are your speakers today. I'm Austin, uh, one of the product managers at Toys Human Biocare and I'll be taking you through the new program. You'll also be hearing from Kaylee and Gemma about their experience with the program as our first certified clients, uh, EcoWare and Emma Lewisham. Now, for those of you less familiar with Toy2 EnviroCare, we provide collective leadership for businesses and organizations to ensure we can all prosper for generations to come. At the heart of what we do is Toy2. Um, Toy2 is an active verb that means to sustain. It's a privilege and a challenge. It asks us to work as individuals, organizations, New Zealanders to care for our planet, our people, our communities. Here at Toy2 EnviroCare, we are catalyzing action for a zero carbon future. We provide clarity and frameworks for action. As a government owned verifier, we're strongly committed to international best practice being science-based. We prioritize continuous improvement in the journey to regenerate our world. Now, Toy2, we've been certifying carbon footprints since 2006. And in those 15 years of issuing carbon zero and carbon reduced certificates to hundreds of organizations around the world, we've seen quite a lot change. But particularly recently, we've been noticing more and more that our clients wanted to know where to next. How can they continue to show leadership? Um, and how is leadership evolving? There's been a really interesting shift uh, here in New Zealand, but also overseas, where there's this increasingly really savvy group recognizing that carbon neutrality, it's, it's not leadership anymore. So at this, uh, you know, this cutting edge space, leadership, it's, it's about taking broader responsibility, showing action much more than just making pledges. It's about moving faster and in line with science. That led us to ask this key question. What should the next tier of climate leadership look like? For the leaders amongst us who are already ready, They're, they want to go faster and bolder. What does that look like? We started looking into a program that went beyond neutrality and found very quickly there, there's no consensus here yet. 
Um, there's no single term, <laughs> there's no standard, there's no program that everyone's agreeing on about what it means to kind of take that next step beyond neutral. So we reviewed as much best practice, policies, positions, science, market research. Um, we, what is the climate need? What do businesses need? What do we know from our years in the carbon space, uh, how this can work? What does that next tier look like? We pulled the best of our findings together to set our own standard. Our answer is resoundingly positive. Climate positive, our latest certification program that's helping you make a better mark on the world. You're giving more to our climate than you're taking. So let's delve into the program a little bit closer. 22 Climate Positive, it's about having a positive impact. Uh, it's not simply doing less or no harm. It's deliberately doing good for both your own direct climate impacts, but broader outcomes as well, making sure that any co-benefits or unintended consequences, they're considered so that you're having an overall positive impact. It is still anchored in climate action, but we're looking beyond just a simple carbon accounting balance sheet. It's considering all the ways that we can deliberately improve, restore, transform, do things differently to help others so that collectively we can build forward better. Essentially, the new program helps you move towards a net positive impact, helping us all create a regenerative future for Papa Tuanuku. Now, us being who we are, this had to be something that we could independently audit. We had to provide full confidence for our clients to make claims to their customers, their investors, staff, stakeholders. It had to be really robust. For each piece of our program, we've built on international standards or frameworks where they exist so that the end result is verifiable and comparable, uh, easily internationally recognized and relevant for those of you that play in the global space. There's clear objective criteria for success and it scales. So whether you're a small Kiwi business and you really just work locally or you're a large exporter, either way, you can get benefits here. Our goal was that for any organization that achieves Toitu Climate Positive, you can tell a positive story to your customers, your stakeholders with confidence and evidence. You have a third party, us, endorsing and substantiating your claims out in the world. Now I've used the word best practice a bit, um, and I should note that it's continuously changing, right? Particularly in this space, there's no such thing as done or perfect yet. Uh, so as new best emerges, we will reflect this by making improvements and refinements to our program, to the guidance and the requirements and helping any members transition so that everyone can collectively aim for better. For our existing carbon members, or those of you who are already doing some work on your carbon footprint in one way or another, the overall process may feel fairly familiar. You know, there's the usual work to measure, reduce, um, you know, compensate for impacts. It's a pretty standard to-do list in this space. With this program, however, each of those steps is going bolder, faster. There's a combination of reducing emissions on the way to actually eliminate them entirely. You're engaging with your value chain. Um, you're compensating above neutrality. You're contributing to broader social and environmental outcomes at every step. There's a real key crucial component here of improvement. A major point of difference with Toy 2 Climate Positive, and we'll explore this a bit more, is that our program, it doesn't just require an accurate measurement of your, you know, whether it's your organization or your product, um, you know, maybe some extra carbon credits. Our version of Toy 2 Climate Positive what we see as the gold standard for positive climate action. We require you to also consider your value chain to set and achieve science aligned decarbonization targets. Decarbonization is a top priority, but climate positive does also require compensation, right? There's carbon credits to, um, or offsets to a total of 125% um, and further impact contribution for wider environmental social outcomes. I'll take you through each of these requirements in a bit more detail to help illustrate how you can achieve this. So overall process here, you're measuring the scale of your climate impacts. You're pursuing science aligned reductions in line with 1.5 degrees of warming. You're engaging across your value chain to accelerate transition here. Each year you'll compensate for emiss carbon emissions to 125%. Um, you'll additionally contribute to a project that helps wider society decarbonize, adapt, or transition. And the annual audit is still a key piece. You have to show, you need it to show annual progress against your targets. 
and it helps support your transparency here, illustrating your commitments as well as your achievements to any of your audiences. Let's start with measurement. And the iceberg model here, it's a, it's a nice metaphor and to think about your, your carbon impacts and your full scale. Emissions, as you know, they come from a series of activities over which you, know, you have a varying degree of control, influence, and ability to measure them. Some activities you have really direct control over. So using petrol in a company owned vehicle, you control the choice of the vehicle, its fuel, how you're driving it, how often you're driving it. You can measure that pretty precisely. That's a, you know, at scope one emission. Uh, moving down to those more indirect emissions, uh, these are activities that you have you know, some degree of control over, but maybe not the whole thing. You can choose if you're flying or taking the train or meeting virtually but you can't really choose the type of jet. You can't choose if that train is electric or diesel. You can't really choose uh, how your meeting tool is managing its cloud emissions. You can reduce the waste you're sending to landfill, but not necessarily the way your landfill manages it. You know, are they capturing the methane, that kind of thing. So these are areas that you can probably measure to some degree, um, particularly these sort of core selected scope threes that any of our members are used to looking at. Um, but there may be some uncertainty in the details. Then there's all the stuff below the surface. These are areas um, like uh, staff commuting, emissions embodied in the goods and services that you pay for, the use of your products by your customers, things that you, you might have only minimal influence over. And uh, for many of us, you're not used to thinking about them as part of your carbon footprint. They can be quite tricky to measure. You know, there might be a lot of assumptions, uncertainty here. When you think about it from a product perspective, a product life cycle footprint, it does span this full length of the iceberg. Uh, you know, ingredients, production, distribution, use, disposal. But you can think about it as sort of a slice of the iceberg. And so there's there's all this other space out there, you know, maybe from your other product lines or just from operational impacts that aren't accounted for in your product footprint. At the end of the day, though, all of these activities and the emissions associated with them, they are to some degree partly you know, that organization's responsibility. It's, it's, they wouldn't exist without us. So um, there's a mix of things that you can measure, things that feel a bit harder, but there are tools, even for the things that are really hard to measure, in, you know, verifiable detail. You can screen, you can estimate, you can kind of understand the scale. How much is here below the surface? Where do you focus your efforts first on engagement and then reduction? Now, as a note for those who are already doing some level of verified carbon measurements, um, whether it's with us or someone else, our program requires a fully verified measurement of your scope one and two, a selected set of scope three emissions, and all of these will be measured and verified in line with um, ISO 14064 part one. The rest of your value chain, the stuff here, you're, there's a mix of uh, measurement and screening and an estimation. And that's also done in line with ISO as well as the GHG protocol, their value chain standard. If you're um, looking at a product footprint, that's in line with PAS 2050. Um, and again, that sort of operational impacts would be in line with ISO, GHG protocol. Either way, you're gonna get a fully verified inventory to inform your action and to substantiate communications. So once you've measured, what do you do about it? Uh, Toy 2 Climate Positive, we require reductions and abatement in line with climate science. We align to the science-based targets initiative, their methodology. Um, so a climate positive member, you'll set a science-aligned absolute reduction target for your operational footprint. There's a reduction or an engagement target for the rest of your value chain. We provide workbook and guidance and so forth to support you in the target setting, as well as mapping out a pathway so, you know, where you are, where you need to be, and what is your pathway to get there? It might be a steady line. It might be something a little bit more bespoke. Those scope one and two emissions, um, those need to be a uh, target in line with 1.5 degrees of warming. The program mandatory scope threes, things like business travel, freight, waste to landfill, those, the, the target can be well below two degrees of warming, but we really encourage those to set those to 1.5 as well. And so, you know, that, that might be this sort of steady target here, 5% a year, something like that. It might be something a little bit more uh, bumpier, essentially. You know, when is my fleet due for renewal? When can I pull that lever? Um, when can I apply for funding or, you know, invest in, you know, my CapEx budget? When, when can I 
adjust and pull these different levers to make bigger jumps in my reductions. Now looking out to your value chain, that's where engagement steps up. So that's engagement outward to your staff, to your suppliers, to your customers. You can get started with the science aligned engagement target. So that might be something like getting two thirds of your suppliers by spend that they will be measuring and managing their own emissions within five years. And that's going to accelerate overall process here. That engagement's gonna help you get a much more precise map of you know, your iceberg, the scale here. Climate impacts are a really great way to evaluate risks across your supply chain, assets, your business model. Um, so that work that the program is catalyzing, it's gonna help you think about what does our business strategy look like? Uh, how can we be more future thinking, future proof? How can we remain insurable, um, investable, and relevant with all these climate change impacts? It'll support your procurement decisions so that you can align with you know, like-minded, future thinking suppliers. Um, again, more risk resiliency, but also opportunities for collaboration, for innovation, you know, working across your sector, for, for example. And collectively, you have these broader outcomes, you know, reduced risks, opportunities, you can present a much stronger, you know, sort of bolder story for your markets, a collective voice to talk to maybe a global supplier that wouldn't always be willing to listen to you on your own. Engaging with your staff, um, that creates a culture that is going to help with uh, attraction, retention, you know, staff engagement. Involving the wider organization, it means more eyes looking for solutions and opportunities. And this can drive innovation in areas maybe you've not yet considered. So those initial emission reductions, they might be fairly low hanging fruit that you knock off, but then innovation will keep you, uh, keep you reducing, keep you headed towards that science line target. Innovation at this level, you know, you're bringing the problem, the search for solutions to your entire company, the shop floor, the procurement desk, the C-suite, your sector and suppliers. And of course, engaging your customers. Uh, so this really highlights you as a climate leader. It embeds sustainability into your brand. You know, bringing your customers with you on the race to zero, it provides a chance for them to engage and participate. That can really enhance loyalty. Um, it can also flow through to new ideas, right? Different product design, new markets, uh, helping everyone sort of support the shift to the more circular model we know we need. Right, so you've measured, you've understood the scale of the impact. What does that heat map look like? You've got some plans in place to work on eliminating and reducing those emissions, including through engagement. You'll still have an annual audit so you can see achievements year on year, demonstrate progress against your plans. We will be formally checking your progress if you sign up to this program against your own targets. We'll check it every three years and make sure that you are in fact on track of what you said you were going to do. But each year, while we're racing towards zero, there will still be some impacts. And as a climate leader seeking a positive result, we have to compensate for those impacts. 22 Climate Positive has a dual approach to compensation. The first piece to compensate here, it's something you're probably very familiar with, offsets, removals, they still play a role in your balance sheet. You know, where applicable, there might be some natural removals, potentially you own a native forest. Um, just like with our Carbon Zero program members, you know, we would support you to account for those removals in your balance sheet. Um, and if you are a program member already, you'd be familiar with the criteria and the requirements around that. But most of us are going to need some offsets to round out compensation. We do not own forestry. So offsets provide a great opportunity there, but there's also a really wonderful opportunity for broader outcomes and helping wider society. Purchasing, canceling an offset, it's a financial tool. Um, you're compensating your emissions by putting funding towards a project, and that project is in turn avoiding, reducing, removing emissions. And as long as you've chosen a high quality carbon credit, the ones that Toy2 works with, the projects are those that they wouldn't actually exist without that funding. Um, you might have heard criticism of offsets um, as you know paying to pollute that kind of that narrative there. And it can be true um, with. If, you, if the organization is just buying credits and not reducing, um, if they've used a really low quality carbon credit, you know, that could be true there. There might be some greenwash, but uh, all of our members would know, and including with Climate Positive, you know, Toy2, we only work with certain carbon credit projects. We really thoroughly vet them. We have very, very high standards before we offer them to our members. And uh, anyone working in a Toy2 carbon program 
a core requirement that we check regular progress on is reductions. So as a TOI2 climate positive member, you're reducing in line with science, you're using high quality carbon credits, you can have a lot of confidence in your compensation strategy here. There's a quantifiable transaction for your climate impacts, you know, that compensation, um, but you're also helping others. Uh, this is broader outcomes here. You're helping to sort of funding this transition to our future. Your work is directly funding things like wind farms, cook stoves, um, you know, converting or restoring land to native forest, things that wouldn't otherwise be possible without the funds from those carbon credits. So it's not just trading, you know, your climate impacts um, and inputs. It's about bringing others along so that we can collectively build forward. For the specific program requirements to achieve certification. So thinking about those uh, from an operational lens here, you know, the scope one and two emissions, a little bit out into your mandatory scope three emissions. The total compensation needs to be at least 125%, and you're balancing out that operational footprint. Same if it's a product footprint, you're balancing out that full product footprint. The 125%, you're using the same high quality carbon projects that we would currently accept. So if you're already one of our carbon zero members, it can just be an extra 25% of the project you already prefer each year. Um, that offset boundary is just the mandatory sort of scope one, two, and three emissions, essentially the same ones that you've been setting your reduction targets against. Um, and if you're already one of our members, you'll be familiar with that list of mandatory um, scope threes, things like business travel, uh, freight, um, waste that you're sending to landfill, that kind of thing. Uh, we deliberately do not ask you, you can, but we don't require that you offset your value chain. You know, it's a, it's a pretty nebulous number for one thing, but also the work to compensate your value chain, um, we're asking you to do that, at least for now, through engagement. That might be you know, education and advocacy that your suppliers, staff, and customers are offsetting their impacts. Um, but even if your engagement, if, if it doesn't touch offsets, if it's just getting those other people measuring and reducing their impacts, that can be a really beneficial outcome. Overall, we know that resources are limited for any business, especially right now. We didn't wanna design a program that's you know, just centered around buying extra credits. Um, that's not the, the mission here. It's important to give back more than we take and have these broader outcomes. Carbon credits will play a role, but your resource and your efforts are gonna be focused primarily at your reductions and your engagement, sort of helping us transform. That said, you know, to truly solve the climate emergency, you know, we can't just look at our own direct impacts. We can't just look at, okay, what did we did last year? How do we balance that out? We need to be looking ahead. How do we design our work? How do we fund our future? Carbon credit projects do play a role in helping transition to that future. But as you're probably well aware, there's a lot of other projects that are out there trying to help us build forward, but maybe they don't align with a carbon credit framework. You know, maybe they don't have a quantified carbon number. They might be more of a social project. Um, they might still need funding just to get off the ground or they're, they're really focused on the research space. We need to fund those projects too. Projects that are helping to reduce present or future emissions that are supporting resilience and adaptation to climate change impacts, things that are supporting a just transition um, so that we can build forward to that better world. So to support this, to show true leadership, the Climate Positive Program is doing something a bit special. We're requiring that all members are contributing to projects that have these broader social and environmental outcomes to deliver that regenerative future. We provide a scorecard and guidance for our members to sort of select and evaluate a project that aligns with your goals. The contribution amount, um, it can be financial, it can be labor time. Based on a financial contribution, the minimum cost, um, it's equivalent to offsetting 75% of your operational footprint at international rates. So essentially, you can plan on an annual compensation budget of 200% of your footprint, your core footprint. 125% is going to your carbon credits, 75% is going to these other projects. Now, of course, your annual footprint will be going down, which helps reduce those, you know, the amount that you need to compensate for year on year. And the faster you reduce, uh, the more resilient you'll be because we know that carbon credit costs are going to rise in the year to come. And of course, there is a bit of flexibility in that budget as well, knowing that you could be gifting labor time rather than a financial contribution to a project. 
Uh, this could be a new project, something new to your operations that you haven't done before. It could also just be work you're already doing, um, and we're able to recognize and endorse that work as part of your overall climate positive position. And in fact, the two pilot partners that you'll be hearing from EcoWare and Emma Lotion, they were both in that position. They were already doing work, and we were just able to recognize that. So what projects count for your impact contribution? This is probably the first question that I get most when we're talking about climate positive. It's about projects that help wider sector or society decarbonize. It could be projects that support um, you know, future reductions or removals. It might be things like pest eradication, uh, wetland or peatland restoration, marine restoration, blue carbon, that kind of thing. They could be research projects. They could be direct on the ground initiatives. Thinking on the more social side, it might be initiatives that are gonna support society on that just transition, uh, work around a living wage, fair trade. It could be increasing access to low carbon technology, sort of one of those, you know, a one for one type program. It might be advocacy work, contributing to infrastructure system change, that kind of thing. There are also climate change impacts that are already hitting us and more that are baked in, you know, even if we stop emissions tomorrow with the level of warming we've already achieved. So the project could be supporting resilience to those impacts, things like flood control, um, you know, protection against sea level rise, drought resilience. Our climate positive members, you'll get guidance and support to choose and evaluate the project that makes sense to you. It's a great way to make sure that you're addressing the specific needs of your customers, your investors, your staff, your communities. You know, think about, you know, what is your brand identity? You know, what are you, what's the story you want to tell? What are you selling? Where are you operating? What are the broader outcomes that are most important to you and to yours? Right, so what do you have to do? How do you get here? You measure, you reduce, and you compensate in ways that are challenging and transformational. Toy2 Climate Positive recognizes and rewards ambition for those who commit to it. You know, progress is continual, there's no done. It's designed for organizations to always be striving to do more. But while you know, that, that might sound really hard and challenging, and you know, there is a real challenge here, but part of every member package comes with Toy2 support. You know, our experts will be on hand to support you in meeting this challenge. Uh, there's you know, tools, workbooks, guidance, that kind of thing. Um, all of that is guiding you to making sure that your work is meeting our certification requirements so that in the end, you can be assured that your bespoke path to science-led meaningful climate action, it's set against the ultimate and best practice you can receive independent certification to endorse it. You get a mark. Any of you who are already certified with us as carbon reduced or carbon zero, um, it would just be some extra requirements to add to your, add to your annual cycle if you wanted to, um, to upgrade and we can support you in that transition if you're ready to meet this challenge. If you aren't yet a Toy2 Carbon member, you know, we'd love to have you join us and you can sign up straight into Climate Positive right away. Um, you can also think about it as a journey and join maybe the Carbon Reduce or the Carbon Zero program and look at upgrading after a year or two. Right, so Toy2 Climate Positive, it pushes climate leaders. Um, you're going beyond neutrality to leave a positive impact, take meaningful science-led action to decarbonize our world collectively. There's an annual cycle to measure your impacts, to reduce in line with science, to compensate above neutrality. There's a balance of achievements and commitments to keep doing better. You know, you're truly transforming your business while you're helping wider society join you on this journey. It was a lot of information and I've already seen some questions come in. Remember, you will get a copy of these slides so you can scan back through them. You'll get a copy of the recording too. And of course, we're always happy to chat with you directly about your situation. Please keep putting your questions in the Q&A box um, and we'll be addressing those in just a moment. In the meantime, Thank you for your attention so far, and I'm going to give you a bit of a break from my voice. Uh, next, we're going to be hearing from our first certified companies uh, and products. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over first to Kaylee from EcoWare, and then we'll hear from Gemma from Emma Lewisham. They have both gone through this process. And then after we hear from those guys, um, we have a lot of time saved for addressing any of your questions. Thanks, Thanks for taking me. Hi everyone, um, my name is Kaylee Honeycomb. I'm the Marketing and Sustainability Lead at EcoWare. Um, Austin, are you okay to flick through the slides for me? Perfect. Um, and the next one. 
So if you haven't heard of EcoWare, um, we provide plant-based compostable packaging to a broad range of businesses and hospitality from like restaurants and cafes to hotels and airlines. Um, we've currently got a lot of the MIQ hotels on board and we've also got um, a lot of schools as part of the Healthy School Lunch program. Um, we've got about 900 products SKUs and um, that includes our sister brand EcoRoll, um, which is a plastic-free FEC certified bamboo toilet paper subscription. So uh, the idea is that we work with our customers on full circle solutions. So not just the packaging solution, but providing access to things like on-site compost bins and education um, collection services so that the packaging ends up in a compost facility and not landfill. Um, essentially like since our inception about 10 years ago, we tried to lead a better way for packaging companies, showing them how to sort of treat more lightly on the planet. And especially at a time right now, um, hygienic disposable packaging has become a way of life. Um, and there's a lot of it out there, which um, obviously is a huge environmental concern. So it's really important for us that we can provide something that's more sustainable. We became Carbon Zero certified eight years ago. Um, and at the time we were the only packaging company to do so, but it's awesome to see so many others that have um, also become Carbon Zero certified. Um, but for us, like climate positive was the ultimate goal um, because we felt like it was one thing to offset your emissions and another thing to actually improve them and make a true positive impact on the planet. Um, and we knew that we wanted to create a business model that supported a healthier earth um, and not just kind of replenished what we took from it. So for us, becoming climate positive didn't really require a lot of change in the way that we operated um, our core product offering because we were already on a mission to try and reduce waste landfill and it was made with more sustainable materials. But it did require us to dive a lot deeper into our supply chain um, and get better transparency across yeah, our suppliers, but also customers as well. Um, so, for example, it really prompted us to put more, form, like more formal processes in place, things like um, procurement of new suppliers or exploring better freight options. Um, there were so many things that we could really like double down on and tighten up to know that we were doing the best that we could um, and that we were being true and authentic to what our mission was as a business. So where we might have shied away from speaking frankly to our supply chain, it's really encouraged us to have more open and like frequent conversations, put processes in place to do so, um, and just make sure that our entire team are aligned as well. So the biggest change for us for, as a company was really the increased time um, on our end because we wanted to make sure that what we were doing was actually best practice and that we had set targets that were aligned with science-based targets and that was the beauty of um, climate positive for us um, but we've always said like sustainability is a journey and it's definitely not a destination and so it's something that we'll continue to work on um, next slide please So I thought it would be good to touch base on our social impact project. Um, yeah, as Austin just mentioned, um, there is so much opportunity and there's so many exciting things you can do where you can actually get involved. We decided that we wanted to put um, time resource and really get like our whole team behind it as opposed to the financial resource behind a social impact project. Um, our social impact project that we've chosen as part of Climate Positive is our school's composting education program. And it's something that we'd actually started planning as part of our 2021 sustainability report and goals, which will be released hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And our project sets out to sort of teach children in New Zealand schools about the importance of composting. Um, and it's not just organic waste, but it's also the compostable packaging and it shows them how to do it as well. So the idea of the project is that it really like develops a legacy of zero waste in our country by teaching the next generation and giving them some tools that they can continue working towards a sustainable circular economy and teach others to do so too. 
So we currently provide compostable packaging for the Healthy School Lunches program. Um, and they provide free school lunches to Kiwi kids in need. Um, and that's schools all over New Zealand. And as a starting point, our program for Climate Positive will piggyback off the back of that. So it was quite a nice sort of, um, yeah, involvement. And the schools receiving these lunches already do have compost bins for food and packaging, which is collected and taken to a composting facility. However, we also want to um, put large compost bins in schools, which make compost themselves for gardens. Um, but I think the key part of this program is instead of teaching them to just put their waste in the right bin, we really want to teach them how to compost properly. So things like providing um, large scale like compost bins into schools and then also providing on-site tutorials and education so that they can actually do it themselves and understand the importance of diverting waste from landfill and see how easy it is. Um, but most of all, the project has a social and environmental purpose, which aligns with the United Nations climate change goals. Um, and Climate Positive really helped us to sort of double down and yeah, flesh that out a little bit. Cool, next slide. Sorry, Austin, could you go to the next slide? Cool. Um, I realized that was quite quick. Um, but if you would like to learn more about what we're doing to try and achieve our climate positive goals, um, there's a heap of information on our EcoWare blog, which is um, yeah just on our website. And you'll also see our 2021 sustainability report, which is very much a reflection of our climate positive program um, and what we've committed to so that the two really sit nicely together. Um, and of course, feel free to reach out with any questions. We're always happy to help. That's really wonderful. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, everyone, please keep putting any questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and next, we're going to hear from Gemma at uh, Emma Lewisham. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Austin. Thanks, Kaylee. Yeah, so I'm Gemma Whiten, and I am at Emma Lewisham. So we are a luxury, a luxury science-led natural skincare brand um, out of here in New Zealand, but we sell across New Zealand, Australia, the UK, the US, and there will be other markets to follow as well. Uh, so the business and, and brand is only a couple of years old, um, but has been built from the outset to be a sustainable business. And so working with Toy2 and certification in this space was absolutely fundamental to the business. Um, what I wanted to do is actually, if you um, pop down to the next slide, that would be great, Austin. I think, you know, most of you on this, um, on this webinar right now are thinking, you know, how do I make this work within our business? Um, why, why would you go about doing the certifications and what are the learnings from it? So that's what I thought I'd, um, I'd focus on. If you want any more information on the process that we have taken or the programs that we have in place, for example, then there's plenty of information on the website. We're also really collaborative in the way that we work with other businesses. So I'm more than happy to have conversations with any of you here on the webinar um, and to talk to you or talk to you about any of the challenges that you're facing. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is why do we get the certification and then the learnings from it. So ultimately, our business aims to set new benchmark in beauty. Uh, we really want to create a positive impact, obviously, for people on their skin and their well-being, but also, of course, on the planet and the way that we do business um, and the way that we um, manufacture and sell our product. And so to do this, you know, it's a big promise. It's a big purpose. And so to do this, we need to take tangible and ongoing actions. And that's absolutely fundamental. As you say, Austin, you know, it's a process. It's a journey. As you say, Kaylee, it's something that we will never be perfect on. Nobody ever will. There will always be more that we can do. So it's about those tangible but ongoing actions. And that's where certifications do come in. But also ensuring that they're credible. It's absolutely fundamental. Um, if you look at recent data from a Consumer New Zealand survey, you've got 49% of consumers in New Zealand just saying that they don't trust environmental product claims. Um, you know, and that's really concerning. And then you've got 72% of them really struggling to work out which products are actually environmental or are better and more sustainable. So something working with Toy2 and getting these types of certifications 
enables us to ensure that people see that these are very credible, that, that, that our products are credible and our claims are credible. So our motivations are starting with just that. Consumers need to be able to trust businesses. And they are fundamentally looking for brands and businesses that are more sustainable, which is fantastic. Um, but then what we need to be able to do is reassure them that the claims that we make and the promises that we make are truly credible. And the only way of doing that is working with um, a business and a group like Toy2 who have that independent certification and that everything is obviously audited and verified. Information is absolutely power and I think when you go through a process like this you really really realize the value of that you know it's if you know your baseline carbon emissions and where they are coming from then you can actually work out where you need to or what you need to do to drive change as well and I think that that having that information gives you um, so much visibility and in doing so enables you to really enact some pretty powerful change. And I think that sort of talks to the next point is if you can measure it, then you can work out what is truly meaningful impact. I'm sure everybody on this call is familiar with the, you know, we can all do a million and one things. There's always so many things we can be working on, so many projects we can be doing. What um, doing a certification like this and having that climate positive certification process enables us to do is to really understand where we have, so where are our greatest carbon emissions, but also where can we truly impact those and therefore create the greatest amount of change. And that's been um, really insightful for us and is a really um, powerful um, part of the certification for us. The fundamental truth, which is awful in the beauty industry, is that we produce globally, the, the entire industry produces globally 120 billion units of waste annually. And this is the industry's largest contributor to carbon emissions. And so the solution to that is creating circularity and packaging. It has a fundamental impact and over 70% improvement in um, the emissions around packaging. And um, it's all well and good to sort of, you know, put circularity into play. But what's really meaningful is being able to quantify the impact of this work. So with the Emolution Beauty Circle um, program that has been put in place, People are able to return their packaging to us. We are able to refill. Consumers can buy refills. And in buying refills, they are improving the carbon footprint by over 70 or up to 74% versus buying a standard product. So you can really quantify that impact because we have done the product version of the climate positive certification. It enables us to get really quite specific and quantify the impact of that work. Austin, if you don't mind just popping onto the next slide. So just quickly, I think probably a lot of you have a lot of questions around how you run a project like this. So just a couple of insights from our perspective and learnings is, as with any project within a business, you know, it makes sense to have a project lead, someone who's really driving it and super passionate about it. Um, we found, because we did it at the product level first, that it actually really helped to have an ops person driving that. And we are in the process of then also doing the business level, and it really helps to probably have a finance person leading that. That's just our experience, but um, has really helped us to take that approach. Definitely think about and work about, um, towards within the business, this being a two-part project. That first of all, it is building the baseline so that you can achieve that certification and really get that visibility. The second part is, is the, you know, it, it just continues that exciting part of ongoing reduction plans. So how you continue to improve year on year as a business. I'm um, just a smaller point, but it's probably quite a good one. It was just a nice little tip from the team within the business that drove this, which is really spend some time setting up the templates to collect consistent information. So you're going to get lots of information, um, which is brilliant from your suppliers and partners. Um, if you can get that as in a consistent format as possible, and Toy2 are fantastic at helping with that, it speeds things up. And I think one of the things for us was just that we learned to ask the right questions. And I think Kaylee talked to this briefly as well, where you know you, we are consistently and going to be consistently talking to our suppliers and partners. And it really helps us to understand what questions to ask them. In terms of business benefits, they're huge. Um, fundamentally, if you're not in the business of doing good business, I think we will fail we you know businesses will fail we will become obsolete um we must fundamentally be in the business of doing good through the products that we sell and the way in which we we do that and i think there's some really interesting examples globally around that and the driving of business success through sustainability is evidenced by certifications 
I mean, you only need to look at Unilever. So I'm, I worked at Unilever for 10 years over in London. And, you know, we had um, really drove the sustainable brands. And those sustainable brands grew 69% faster than the rest of the Unilever business. And that's up from 46% the year before. So you can see that driving good business, being sustainable, delivers business results as well. Um, I think though in terms of this, you know, the climate positive certification for us, what it's really done, which I love, is it shows you what great looks like. So as a business, there is always the risk that we can do increments of good. We can just keep improving on what we are doing. But that doesn't necessarily mean we're doing something that's really great, that really is reducing carbon emissions significantly. And I think what Toy2 allow us, allowed us to do is to see what great looks like so we can put roadmaps in place to get there, which is um, exciting. And what that does is truly inspires the internal team. You know, people um, love being a part of this journey. It really, there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of enthusiasm for it. Um, and it really gets them quite excited about how stretching we're being as a business and the journey that we're on. And so important, I mean, I'm a marketer as well as looking after the sustainability side of things. It's absolutely everything to be able to communicate your sustainability story to your consumers. Ultimately, consumers are looking for better products. They are looking for sustainable brands. They are looking for sustainable businesses. And it's all well and good to say we're sustainable, you know, but the issue is, I think, Mark, you asked a question about greenwashing. The reality is, is if you do not have those independent certifications, then ultimately there's no one verifying that you really are doing what you're doing. Um, so it allows us to really talk to consumers, to talk to them in a really exciting way, but with really tangible information you know, about the facts and figures about how much we are saving from a carbon emissions point of view and where we're headed with the business as well. And um, the certification, so we've done it at the product level um, within the business, and it was incredibly inspiring because what it does is, like I've talked to a little bit before, it just gives you that visibility on where you can create the greatest change. So you can even look at a product by product basis. We've had 17, so our 17 products have been certified and we will we will continue to certify all of the MPD that we launch as well. And it just means that you can really tangibly see, even at a product level, product by product, how we can drive the greatest level of change. And um, I just wanted to end on a sort of final point really, that being certified reinforces our commitment to constantly challenge ourselves. This is not about just constantly challenging ourselves once and, and then sort of stepping back. This is about constantly challenging ourselves because we can always be more innovative. We can always do better um, and we can always reduce our carbon emissions even further. And what that allows us to do is use our brand and our business as a real force for good, which is ultimately what we all want to do. And I'm sure everyone on this call is very passionate about um, given that you're all here today listening to, um, to Toy2 and to us. So um, as I said before, we're incredibly collaborative in the way that we work. We'd love to help other businesses on their journey in this space as well. Um, so do feel free to get in contact um, via our website or um, I'm sure the guys will send my um, information out and I'm on LinkedIn as well. You know, feel free to reach out. We're more than happy to help you along the way. Thanks so much, Austin. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we will move to questions now. Uh, we do have some that are in the Q&A box in the chat and we'll address those. And I've got Gemma and Kaylee and a few others that can help me answer questions as well. Um, so uh, please feel free to keep, keep those coming through. Um, there was one about the product footprint standard, which I've, I've written an answer to, but essentially there didn't used to be an ISO standard for products, um, and so we aligned with the British Standard Institute's PAS 2050. There is an ISO standard now, and we're um, undergoing the process right now to be accredited to issue certifications under it, but they are very similar. The work is between those two standards is very similar. Um, one of the questions is around the 125% number for compensation for offsets. Um, you know, why not? any other number really. Uh, we, one, one point there is there's, there's no consistency out there yet. Anyone who else who's doing some sort of a, you know, positive or negative position here, uh, there's a lot of different arguments for what to, to set. We chose 125 because we felt that it provided a lot more confidence around any inherent uncertainty in the, you know, your measurement of your emissions, that that inherent, uh, inherent uncertainty would be kind of 
balanced for and accounted for. Um, all of our members are encouraged if they want to go above and beyond that 125, they, they certainly can do. And as we get more information or as new best emerges, you know, we may well change that level um, and help our, our members transition to that as well. Um, let's see here. Uh, special recognition for those who offset their value chain as well, even if it's an estimated number. Um, I think uh, Gemma and Kaylee, you guys might agree, but you know we're always happy to recognize when you're going above and beyond. Um, when you look at, say, like a disclosure page, things like that, it notes you know sort of where they have gone above a minimum con uh, contribution. So that would definitely be encouraged. Um, you know, as long as those other pieces are, are happening, yeah, we're very happy to to recognize that. You know, we're offsetting the core operations to a higher number, anything like that. And I suppose it gives you something else to talk about, doesn't it? It's another message that you can talk to consumers about. Um, I think the trick is just working out how to do so in a way that is really easily understood. Um, yeah. And, then, you know, like Toy2 can help with that messaging as, as well. Yeah, yeah. I know there, there are companies out there that are doing things like, you know, uh, subsidizing their staff to measure their personal emissions and then offset those or kind of doing a one for one and creating... Uh, a green fund, um, you know, that kind of thing. So there, there's a lot of other options there as well to kind of help, you know, kind of offset or compensate for those impacts without it being strictly through carbon credits. Um, we've got a question from Mark about greenwash. How do we prevent greenwash happening, um, especially to ensure, you know, it doesn't devalue the Toy2 brand, Toy2 customers? And this is something that we are very passionate and, and committed to. It's one of the reasons that we're so, uh, so very obsessive about being science-based and aligning with any international frameworks for best practice that we can. Um, we're really excited to see, uh, hopefully later this month, the SBTI, the Science-Based Target Initiative, they're publishing a net zero framework, and that's going to produce a lot more really great guidance and frameworks to kind of help, you know, what does it mean to be heading towards that net zero we all keep hearing about? What does it look like to race to zero? Um, and so we'll, as that new best you know, emerges, we'll keep evaluating that. Um, and of course, you know, we're always happy to endorse our customers. So if anyone was accused of something, we have a lot of evidence to support you. Um, and part of the membership package, um, as, as you know, Mark, is that, you know, we will help you with your claims. So, you know, what are you going to put on your package? Oh, actually, we might tweak it this way. We'd, we'd recommend you word it this way. Um, things like that to kind of help protect you against any of the ways we've seen greenwash accusations happen over the last 20 years really. Gemma or Kaylee, do you want to add anything to that around greenwash? Probably just that that's exactly where certifications come into play. Um, mm -hmm. You know, certifications give consumers a quick and easy and trustworthy way to determine whether a business is really legit or not. Um, and there are, um, you know, I think the more that brands recognize that, the more brands that have the certifications, the more that consumers will understand that. And already, you know, if you think about it, not tested on animals, for example, is a claim that many brands have been making and they use the certification, you know, for that kind of thing. So consumers are very used to looking for that sort of thing. And I think it's just then about being really care about the language that you use to communicate to consumers. Um, and that helps to make it really understandable and to make sure that you're not greenwashing. And it means that you can, you know, answer any questions that consumers have with real transparency. And I think Toy2 have been a huge help with that. Um, like you say, you know, being able to help us with our claims, with our language and being really consistent and really clear um, mm -hmm. certainly helps to avoid the greenwashing situation. Yeah, I would say pretty much what Gemma said is bang on. Um, I think for us, because we were sort of first to achieve uh, climate zero and sorry, carbon zero, and also um, now we're kind of going into this climate positive, it's, it's always something that we have been prepared to kind of um, answer and also front foot. Mm -hmm. um, I think like yeah, greenwashing is definitely, <laughs> it's, it's quite contentious, but it does show good intent. Mm -hmm. um, but as Gemma said, the more that you can pull on your certifications and you can really put those front and center, I think the, the best chance you've got. And I think like we, we've got so many people in the packaging space as well. And it can be really confusing because there's so many different um, 
<laughs> terms that people use and sometimes they can essentially mean the same thing and sometimes they can't so a huge part of what we do is also educate um mm. And I think that's why we try and work as closely as possible with industry partners um, and just share and just be extremely transparent about information as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The transparency, being precise. Um, some of the recent ones that I've seen in, internationally, um, there was one in the UK with uh, corn, the sort of like uh, protein plant-based protein thing. There was one, you know, Allbirds, if you guys have been following Allbirds um, and their IPO. And it's just, it's interesting. A lot of the, a lot of it comes back to, you know, were you precise enough? Were you clear enough? Could a reasonable person understand what you meant? And if not, you know, and with Allbirds in particular, sort of, you know, did you have that independent voice backing you up? And so, you know, yeah, certification is really a core answer there. Yeah. And the process, the process of certification means that you're collecting the information. Again, that sort of information is everything. So yes. that when you are challenged, when you are questioned, you can go back to the data. You know, the data is there. And then in addition to that and going through the certification, it's been independently verified as well. So um, I think that just gives you everything that you need to be able to answer the questions and any challenges that come your way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we've had someone ask if we have any customers that have done this to date, and we do. We have um, Emma Lotion, you guys have certified all of your products uh, so far, and uh, EcoWare, you've certified your business operations. Um, please join the, their, their ranks. <laughs> you know, we're, we can't wait to have more of you join them, but th those are the two that have come through. We, we only just launched in uh, September, so it is quite a new offering for us. Um, let's see here. Uh, we've got one for Kaylee. Kaylee, how many schools do the composting, um, do you do the composting education with currently? And what level are they? Primary, post-primary? Yeah, good question. A lot of this is going to come with the um, project that we've laid out for the next few years. Um, it's a fairly new program. It only kicked off, we've only sort of join that partnership in March this year. Um, so how it works at the moment is we supply the caterers, like for example, Eat My Lunch, um, and then they provide lunches into deserving schools. And I think there's about 550 schools um, that are on the program at the moment. And when I last checked, there was over like 8 million lunches that have been served. So it's it's quite a large program at the moment, um, but the way that it's set up and because it's with multiple caterers, it's also quite tricky to get insight and data and information. So that's gonna be a core part of what we do as part of this impact contribution. So we can better measure and then better be involved in the schools. Um, but I would say like we do, we do have relationships with, some schools that are on the program. And I would say we've probably got around a hundred schools that we know are using the composting or receiving compostable packaging and have compost bins. So it's gonna be up to us now to kind of double down on what schools we can work with over the next few years to make the largest impact. Um, and there are both primary and senior schools. Um, so yeah, like very varied. It's quite a it's quite a big operation. Wonderful. Hopefully that helps answer. Yeah, we do have quite a lot of questions here, and just um, if you haven't been watching the clock, there are only a few minutes left. Um, we are recording, and we will keep recording. So if you do need to drop off, um, and we haven't answered your question yet, uh, just uh, when you get the recording, you can check at the end of the recording for your answer. Um, let's see here. Uh, so uh, question from Juliet. We're about to be audited for carbon zero. How soon can we apply? Um, we're already doing projects that would likely align with us. And that is so exciting. That's actually a conversation I've had with a few people. Like we're, we're already doing this work. How do we, how, we want recognition. How, how quickly can we join? Um, and uh, I would suggest start with your, your usual contact at Toy2, your account manager. Um, they'll be able to help you work out whether it's something that you want to sort of upgrade to right away. Um, sort of you, you finish your audit and then you go ahead and upgrade after that. Um, or if you wanted to sort of spend the next year doing the work and upgrade it the following year, either of those pathways is fully possible. Um, so yeah, if you're one of our members already, just talk to your account manager. They'll be able to answer your questions for your particular situation. If you're not one of our members and you want to join, um, we'll we'll include some contact details in the after email. Um, but if you just reach out to info at toy2.co.nz, um, we'll get you squared away. Uh, Clinton, um, 
is asking for some examples that you guys might share about your engagement and how it changed, changed or is changing your practice with your suppliers. And um, you know, was anything different with Climate Positive or was it work you were already doing? Gemma? Yeah, I think in some respects, it means that you know what questions to ask, which is, is, is really powerful. And I think you feel more confident in going in and having those conversations, um, which is also very good. And it just, the, the very fact that we're going through this process and we want to take our suppliers with us, we want them to be a part of the journey with us, helps them too. I mean, in, you know, in this day and age, those businesses, our manufacturers, our partners are wanting to improve their sustainability you know, profile, or they want to reduce their carbon emissions, or they want to do, you know, they're making significant changes too. So it's about collective collaboration all coming together on this journey and all making a change so I suppose in some ways it makes it easier to have the conversations the right conversations with the right people in the right way um, and that sort of brings everyone on the journey together I think it's been um, a real positive outback of the certification process. Mm. How about you Kaylee? Um, yeah, so simple answer. Yes, it did change our procurement policy. Um, however, it was stuff we were already doing and conscious of, but it just helped formalize it. And I think the other thing it helped do is really align our EcoWare team. So we have um, a couple of operations managers that deal mostly with um, suppliers and do a lot of the procurement process. So it was good to have everybody on board so they fully understand what the process was um, and how we go about onboarding new suppliers and working with them. And then the other thing that we definitely weren't doing enough of is having conversations with existing suppliers um, and making sure that we were constantly prompting. Um, so Climate Positive really put in place a process for doing so. It held us accountable, or it's going to hold us accountable. Um, yeah, so it's it's probably more about formalizing it than it was changing it, if that makes sense for us. Yeah, it is right on one o'clock. If anyone does need to drop off, um, we will keep going. Um, and that goes to my uh, panelists as well. I know that we all have a lot of uh, family uh, requirements as well as work obligations right now. So, um, but I will keep going if nothing else. Uh, from Gisela, are you doing any work uh, to educate consumers about the definitions of carbon reduce, carbon zero, climate positive? There's a lot of confusion about what these terms even mean. And you are so right, there is a lot of confusion. Um, and it doesn't help that for each of those, you know, positions, there's also a lot of other synonyms or words that might sound similar, but actually everyone has a slightly different definition there. Um, it's something that we are working on and we're going to uh, very actively uh, accelerate that education piece and particularly working in the consumer space. Um, it's also something that collectively we can all do a lot better the more that we're using the same sort of language and being precise that does really help, but knowing, you know, why should I use this term over that term? Um, you know, why climate positive over carbon positive or carbon negative or carbon minus or any of the other ones that I've seen out there. Um, it's something and and new terms also keep emerging, you know, net zero increasingly means something quite different than it did about 10 years ago. Uh, it's it's no longer just a net accounting balance. It's actually a completely different position of, of climate action. And so there is a lot of confusion that's very noted. We're working on a few things right now that should be out soon around you know, terminology and claims and glossary, but also uh, a real mission to help educate. And any of our members um, that can join us in that mission of educating and you know, let's, let's all start using the right, um, the, not the right, let's all start using the same terms and helping everyone pick those right terms. Um, it's a bit of a mission for us all as a collective. Hmm. Uh, another one for Gemma. Gemma, have you seen a change in sales once you started marketing your Toy 2 certification? Um, so, you know, yes, you certify to support the environment, but we all still need to make money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is the question that is asked all the time, I think, no matter what business you're in. Um, so I suppose I'd answer that question two different ways. And um, one, in terms of Emma Lotion and the process that we've been through, we launched a couple of weeks ago. Um, so in terms of our communications, so it's, it's very early days in that respect. But I think the reality is, so if you look at New Zealand data and New Zealand numbers, over 80%, about 82% of New Zealand consumers want to be doing better, like they want to be making better choices um, from a sustainability perspective. The reality is, is that if you're not paying in the space, you're not even going to be considered. You're not going to be a brand or a business that consumers even consider 
let alone buy. So I think the reality is it's not just the the benefit and the business sort of um, kick up as it were, but it's the risk to the business and not doing so. It's almost an absolute fundamental now to really be able to compete in the market. Um, so, and I think that what we will see certainly over time is just continued um, uh, benefit for the brand um, as a result of it. I think if you look at though at a really big level, so you know, talking to those Unilever stats again, and I think they're very good stats to talk about, just because it is one of the biggest businesses in the world. Um, mm. It has billion euro brands, um, many of them, and so you know, really driving success at Unilever is is tough. But if they can do it, then anyone can. And the very fact that their sustainable brands grew 69% faster than the rest of the business. That's not six, that's not nine, it's not 10%, it's 69% faster. Just genuinely shows how um, doing good business, i.e. being sustainable, drives business success and increasingly does so. So I think there's lots of good examples around the globe. So I would say, yes, it fundamentally does. Yeah, definitely. Um, there's a quite a specific question here. Uh, we toy to um, we have a relationship with the CDP, and so aware of the silver certification that we have. Is there a goal to go gold? Uh, not currently. We're quite happy with the silver um, verification partner status. Um, we're endorsed by the CDP for our science-based target services. Um, as well as our carbon programs as a pathway to reporting with the CDP. Um, and uh, it's all working quite well at the moment, but if we if we saw advantages to going gold, um, we wouldn't sort of, uh, we'd be willing to entertain that, but at the moment it seems to be working quite well. Um, if you want to uh, talk about that any more specifically, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, and another question about sending a list of the, the sort of the projects that could work as an example, and I will definitely make sure that you get those in the email that we'll send out afterwards um, to give you some more ideas about what kind of projects you might support there. Uh, let's see here, we've got a few more. Um, so one about uh, measuring scope emissions and how challenging it can be, particularly for the small to medium enterprises. It can actually discourage businesses from getting started um, and how to, you know, any advice there. And I think um, from my perspective, the advice is always just get started and you can kind of, you can build from there, even if you can only sort of estimate a few things using a tool like, for example, our carbon assess tool, um, the climate action toolkit, something like that, where you're just, you're starting to get a sense of what you can do there. Um, over time, you know, you might be able to make the business case for uh, doing something differently. You know, maybe you need to work on developing your systems or your software and it gets easier from there. Um, and I think collectively, we all can acknowledge that scope three emissions, particularly those further out in the value chain, they are really hard for everyone, even the large corporates. Um, and it's something that because there's so much attention here, we, and I know quite a lot of others are working on what are the solutions here? Um, how can we help everyone make this much more easy to understand our shared and our um, individual contributions to, you know, a value chain or really a value net, you know, it's not really a linear process. Um, Kaylee, you guys were quite small when you got started. Do you have anything to add there about, you know, sort of getting started on the journey? Yeah, I guess the the journey to, you're talking about climate, um, sorry, carbon zero. I think just anything, you know, just getting started with carbon work, really. Yeah, it was hard because it was before my time. Um, <laughs> it was it was more of something that um, the owners, James and Alex, mm. took on when the business was really small. So there was only a few of them. And I think that for them, and I'm speaking on behalf of them, so um, hopefully this is helpful, but I think the whole the whole concept of compostable packaging, mm -hmm. it was a very sustainable and it was quite innovative for its time anyway. And they're the kind of guys that don't really do things by halves. And so they felt that it was good to have as much credibility behind them as possible. Um, and it was definitely, I know it was tougher in the earlier days, um, but it's been worth its weight in, yeah, in gold with um, having the, the, the mark. I mean, it, it's really what they fall back on. So it's what they've helped sell, sell themselves into. It's been a big part of um, selling into a lot of the larger businesses as well, like the hotels, the airlines and the schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, we really couldn't have done that without having that credibility behind us. 
Mm. In, in smaller, I, it can be, you know, it can seem a little bit scary from a resource perspective, but actually smaller is the best time to do it because you do all that baseline work when you're small um, because your business is only going to get more successful and, and bigger and more complicated <laughs> from there on out. <laughs> And if the baseline stuff is already done, it's so much easier than just to add your new products on top of that or mm -hmm. new services on top of that. Mm -hmm. So I'd actually say that is the perfect time to do it um, before things get really unwieldy. <laughs> That's a really, really good comment, Gemma, because it has made it has made our life a lot easier as well going into climate positive because a lot of the stuff has already been completely embedded. And I, I think I said that in my slides. Um, mm -hmm. It really wasn't a huge change for us, luckily, because we had done it from the get-go and yeah. it was something that was just set out in our business mission from yeah from the start so I was quite lucky in that sense that I came into a business where they were already really focused on it and really passionate about it and all of our policies or ways of working really reflected yeah a lot of the the work that Toyota were doing yeah so exciting to hear that I love I love these stories um, let's see here where are we at. Uh, there's a question about the program fees and um, as uh, those of you who are already members with us, as you know, we go through a process to sort of evaluate the scale and how much work is to be done there. You know, how, how long would it take us to audit your footprint? How big is it? That kind of thing. Um, there is a premium for this program on top of our uh, compared to sort of our carbon reduce or carbon zero membership. In addition, you get an extra sort of a support package to help you through everything depending on where you are in the journey, you know, if you've already done some of this work or you still need um, extra support. Uh, so if you're interested in upgrading, I suggest you just reach out to us and we'll help you, you know, what would your specific uh, fee package look like? Uh, there's a question about if you're already actively involved in social in, uh, initiatives, can you opt out of the that piece for the climate positive program? And I think I, my answer would be actually you don't need to opt out in the sense we would just endorse the work you're already doing. And so you know, you can just sort of list here are all of the things we're already doing. And, you know, here's some evidence to show you just how much work we're already doing here. And we would, you know, it's a, it'd be a very easy box for you to tick essentially, because you're already doing that work. Um, I think as with uh, Emma Lotion and EcoWare, they were both already doing the projects and it was just a, you know, does it tick the box? Yes, it does. It's a great project. Um, easy peasy. Uh, let's see here. Um, one from uh, David in setting reduction plans and targets uh, to get certified. How does this work for a business that is growing quickly? You know, thinking about absolute emissions versus intensity, which is such a crucial question. This is one that we at Toy2 are really struggling with. We're in a growth phase. We've set science-based targets. And how on earth are we going to, you know, squish our business travel to basically no footprints, um, but grow our business when travel currently as part of our business model. It's it's something that we're all dealing with here. Um, in some ways for us, having that target is really helpful and it sort of forces us to think, okay, we have to deliver the same result to an increasingly you know, number of customers, same quality, same standards, but we have to do so without increasing our carbon footprint, um, even with intensity, like there's no, there's no wiggle room here. And so it's really forcing us to think about, are there new technologies we should be exploring, new business avenues? Um, it's, it's that real innovation piece of how can we do things differently? And we, some of those are things that we're trying out now. Some of those are things that, you know, okay, we might have to wait for better, you know, virtual avatar technology so that we can do more remote audits that way. But in the meantime, what could we do with a drone? What could we do with a phone and a FaceTime call? Um, that kind of thing. So it is hard, absolute reductions are genuinely hard, but it's also absolutely what the climate needs. And so um, an intensity metric might also be shown, but it has to be an absolute reduction target. I can comment on this as well. And I think yeah. that question, I think you all, you remember Austin was <laughs> probably the biggest challenge that we had as a business trying to work out how to make absolute reductions when we were growing and we wanted to grow so you know you've got your growth targets going this way and your emission targets going this way and it's really tricky when especially when you're in a um packaging company it's a product just like Gemma is and you're wanting to increase the number of products which means that you need to increase the amount of freight um and so we had to get really creative I guess and it was more about just getting like as much insight and data as possible and that's what's so great about climate positive is that it provides all the resources to do that so 
we were able to dive really deep in each of our missions and see where we were able to have an impact. And there were definitely areas where we couldn't. We knew that that wasn't going to be possible for us, but there were areas that we hadn't thought of where mm -hmm. we thought, yeah, actually we can work towards the reduction in this area and it was going to have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that, that's definitely something that we've come up against um, and we've been able to problem solve through. Yeah, actually it built on that failure as well, you know, and being really, it forces you to be really innovative and that's yeah. exactly what business needs. And so what I, what I, we found, um, just if I go to my Unilever experience, the cost savings that we drove from the innovative solutions that were put in place to reduce carbon emissions were immense, mm -hmm. immense, significantly above any um, expectations. And, you know, we see that within a small business as well, as if you're coming up with really clever, innovative solutions around freight, and invariably means that you're saving money in the way that you do and move products around as well. So I'd yeah. say that's an additional benefit to the innovative thinking is that it reduces both your carbon emissions, but also your cost to your business. And that's so important when you're a small business and a growing business is mm -hmm. to find those solutions or those sort of innovative approaches early on means that you um, then, you know, get greater cost savings off of it over a longer period of time. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And um, some of the sort of collaboration and engagement is going to help you find some of those things, you know, could you, could you vehicle share with another company that has nothing to do with you, but you both need to get something or people to a certain place at the same time or different, you know, it's, it's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of opportunity out there. Once you just start thinking, okay, what would it take for this to be true? And uh, coming up with some really crazy ideas and just giving them a go. Yeah. Um, uh, lots of really kind messages uh, about the program, but also about um, EcoWare and Emolution's work to date. Those are lovely, and we're so excited to hear that this has been um, of interest to everyone. Um, please keep in touch and keep engaging with us on this. Um, see, a question about the starting point for embarking on the certification, um, particularly if you've already implemented, you know, carbon zero emission reductions over the previous decade. Are those, uh, you know, mitigation actions from the past taken into account? Do you start with a clean slate? Um, I think the answer could be sort of either or both. Uh, you might sort of use that historical baseline and your work to date, and you're just continuing to double down on that. Um, but you might also be able to justify that actually we're going to start fresh. We're going to set a new base year. 2020 is our new base year. We're going to set that as our, our new baseline and, and look at that. Um, it's, it's interesting, actually, some of the uh, sort of global corporate climate leaders are starting to talk about what do we do with our past emissions? How do we compensate for those? and the scale of both how on earth do you measure those, but then how do you find the right compensation to balance those out? That's something that's, it's not really gonna be approachable as a mainstream option, but thinking about that and being able to show that actually you've been doing this you know, from the get-go or for a really long time is part of your overall positive story. And um, there certainly would be ways to, to recognize that as well. Um, just one question about Allbirds and was it an honest mistake? And I don't know because I don't actually speak directly with Allbirds. I've been following this more in the news and um, sort of hearsay. Uh, my understanding is that it was honest mistake. Um, they were trying really good, but they're also, they're in, as so many of us, they're kind of trying to run really fast. And there's always a lot of questions when you're the first one in the beginning of the race. Um, so yeah, but I, I do think it, I, I do think they are doing, uh, genuinely trying to do good work. It's just, they, they need to maybe I think a little bit more third party verification in there, but I don't know. <laughs> um, let's see, I think, uh, oh, one question about um, Gemma, if you're up for sharing any of the Unilever data at all, um, just to help make business cases. So if that's something, if there's any sort of publicly available. Yeah, so I just replied to that actually just oh, for the data chat. So I've just said, yeah, if you search Unilever Sustainable Living Brand Success, you'll certainly find all the information. But I just typed into the chat there just the stats that I quoted um, in my um, talk. That's really great. Thank you. Um, we've gone a bit over time. Like I said, you'll get the recordings. You can go back through these questions and answers if you need to. Really appreciate everyone's engagement and attention today. A huge thank you to Gemma and Kaylee for joining us and talking about your journeys here. Um, and I hope that you all keep this conversation going. We'd love to talk to you more about this. Get in touch. Um, and we'll send everyone an email with a lot of details. Um, I've been taking some notes about what we're going to provide to you guys. So we'll be in touch. Thank you so much today. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.